Information about the world of running, inspiration to fuel passion and excellence, and ideas for making connections and finding community. You're listening to A to Z Running. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the A to Z Running podcast, where we help runners thrive. I'm Andy. And I am Zach and Patty Catalano Dillon shares her epic marathoning legacy of the 1970s and 80s from world records to sage advice. Patty has been to the top and shares the perspective to prove it. And stick around after that for the latest from the world of running, including amazing performance at Milrose and the coldest marathon ever. Literally. And I'm using literally literally <laughs> now you need to remember because now is the time to remember it to go to a to z running.com and look for the word follow because that's how we are going to communicate with you the greatest of the good things that are not happening while we're talking on the podcast including the digest which if you have not yet received is wonderful chock full of both information and practical helpful things like promo codes discounts and serv on services and other products and things like that, as well as an opportunity, always an opportunity, share your questions and all of the other things on your mind. And if indeed you do ask a question, you can post it in social media places. You can send it directly. Find us on adsrunning.com. Why is that so valuable to you? Because we'll answer it on air at the end of our month and we do a monthly q a episode and if you missed january's it was recent and you should definitely check it out so you can hear all about interesting comments on garmin data winter running and more and more and that more often comes from you like we said last week was your questions and interacting with us we really appreciate everybody who has chipped in to discuss running and nerd out with us that's really what we love the most so z step Last week gave us an incredible article, some research about smiling. And I had challenged many of you guys to share a smile, a picture of you smiling while running on social media. And a lot of you guys did that. And it brought a smile to my face too. So it's kind of like a circular thing. Um, yeah, but there's research to prove that too. <laughs> and I'm sure there's research to prove what exactly is wrong with me when people tell me to smile and I immediately think, now I'm going to frown just because you said that. <laughs> well, you can work on that, Zach. I will try. <laughs> now that there's research, it probably will motivate you a little bit more. Hey, and with all that, I think we're ready. So let's get started. Today's guest is Patty Catalano Dillon. And Patty dominated women's running in the 70s and 80s, setting world records in the half marathon, 30K, and 20K distances. She also held American records in the marathon, half marathon, 30K, 15K, 10 mile, and five mile events. That all of them. That sounds pretty dominant. I think the answer is all of them. <laughs> all of them. Currently, Patty is a motivational speaker and running coach. As a pioneer for women's athletics and indigenous people, Patty Speaks. In fact, Patty Speaks is the name of her website, and Patty Speaks 227, her marathon time, is her Instagram yeah. handle. I also wanted to mention there's a movie coming out based on Patty's life and her running career is a really big part of that story, as you would imagine. Today, it's an honor to have Patty on our show, sharing how she has faced fears, took seriously the challenge of discovering her best, which in turn ended up being the best in the, the best, whole world, the <laughs> and she broke barriers for the history books in the process, paving the way for women's running. So let's hear from Patty. Hi, how are you? So good to see you. Good to see you too, Patty. It's so amazing to have you on the show today. We just gave our audience a little bit of a background on who you are, what you've done for our sport, for yourself, even <laughs> on this journey. Oh, thank you. Thank you. So let's thank get you. started. Okay. I would love to know what was childhood like for you, Patty? I grew up in Quincy, Quincy, Massachusetts, just outside of Boston. And during that time, and I was one of the kids who would go and I must have been about 10, 11, and I ended up learning to ski. 
to water ski prior to that. So when the water skiing thing came around, I must've been about 12 that I could actually try out and participate in, in competitions and displays or whatever. So at the time I was really uh, like little, <laughs> like little. And so <laughs> they lined us all up and we were gonna practice and I made the cut. I, I made the cut, I was really happy. I made the cut, but my cut was that I would be on the top of the pyramid. <laughs> Wow. I know. So, you know, here I am, the little thing. I must have been 80 pounds. So that took a little gumption. And yes. Uh, at first I wasn't afraid. And then I realized what the heck I was doing. I, I became afraid. <laughs> and so when I did that, I got nervous and I wouldn't be able the, the people I was climbing on, because there's a way to climb. You go on the thighs and then you go on the shoulders and then I had to go on another one and then I had to go to the top. So I had three people and then no, four people, three people, two people, and then get on top. There's a thrill element, but also there's uh, a freeness that um, it's a confidence, a trust, that things are going to be okay, and also the courage that you could do it. And that's where I come in. I was always afraid to do things, but however, when I did commit to do it, it was like, okay. So when I would climb and they knew I was tight or they would just say, okay, it's okay, Patty. It's okay, Patty. It's okay, Patty. And I'd be like, I learned to breathe then. <laughs> That's a but great it was lesson. Fun. So I ended up doing it. And then um, years go by and I, I had dropped out of college and I worked as a nurse's aide for 10 years and I was into, I must've been in my seventh, eighth year. And I was totally dissatisfied with, you know, I'm what, 23 years old, <laughs> you know, 23, <laughs> you know, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> nothing do you know <laughs> and I had been working as a nurse's aide in the hospital I had a nice thing you know I had a 401k I had three weeks vacation I had sick days I worked on I was a floater after a while because that's what I love to do it was very exciting very hard uh, on your toes type of thing and I thrived on that however I was on this particular floor M3 and I got my list of the patients I was to take care of. And I recognized the last name and I thought, huh, okay. A, a guest came on, a visitor, and I recognized her. And it was the person I had graduated from high school with. And she had cut her hair um, and she just looked stunning. She had a navy blue suit on with a cream V-neck thing and a carrying a briefcase, nice pumps. <laughs> and here I am, you know, hair slicked back. <laughs> tied back you didn't know I had long hair I had on a uniform a pink uniform and I for some reason even though I loved my job I loved what I was doing and I was pretty good at it um I just felt diminished <laughs> when mm. I saw her so I kind of got to know her a little bit better and everything but I just looked at myself and I thought man whatever she has <laughs> I want it. <laughs> of course, you know, all this, we all know, you know, high self-esteem and low self-esteem and confidence. And I didn't know any of those words. And, and if I heard them, they would not mean anything to me. All I knew is what she had, I wanted. <laughs> so I thought the first step I would do, because she was stunning. She was just absolutely stunning. And I thought, huh, well, she looks great. I look awful. She looks great. And I thought, well, I want to look great too. So I thought maybe, you know, I'd lose weight. You know, that was the key because I had gotten a little bigger, you know, um, my ties after work. I got out of work at 1230. It, it was like this for the longest time and running um, my first day of running. I read a book, Dr. Ken Cooper, not a book. I read the chapter not the whole chapter, just a little bit. And it was this thing called jogging. And I thought, what the heck is jogging? Cause I looked up <clears throat> in this book, it was the most caloric thing you could burn. And I didn't know what a calorie was. I didn't quite understand it. So I, I found that out, it was 3,500 
calories to make a pound. And I thought, oh my gosh, <laughs> I'm carrying a lot of calories. <laughs> so I thought I'd burn it. And that was cross country skiing, uh, snowshoeing, and this thing called jogging. Well, I'm not going to cross country ski, not then. And um, I'm not going to snowshoe, not then. And I looked up jogging, jogging's running. <laughs> so I couldn't understand why the heck they didn't just say running. Right. So I, did, I know, right? What's this jogging? In any case, I, um, I continued to read a little bit more and it said to wear your more, your more comfortable pair of shoes, which at the time was knockoff, <clears throat> excuse me, knockoff Tom McCann's earth shoes, <clears throat> where they had a wide toe box and it was a negative heel. And it was perfect to me. I said, okay, I'll wear those. It cost me 19 bucks, 19.99. And um, more, more comfortable pair of clothes, whereas my Daisy Dukes, because at that time we all, you know, took the needle <clears throat> on our jeans. We cut off our jeans and took, made the fringe. <laughs> so I had a very right. long fringe. That's what we used to do. So I had that and I went down to my mother's house and got some of my father's Oh, old boxing stuff. I, there was a neoprene belt, which I put on and uh, those sweatshirts that were made really well back then <clears throat> that didn't breathe. <laughs> they were really heavy. So I must have had four of those on. And I started. And I rode my bike to the Quincy Cemetery because I didn't want anybody to see me. <laughs> because nobody ran. I'm like, I mean, you know, like, I really didn't see people running. You know, you didn't talk about it, I didn't hear it or anything. I went into the cemetery, locked up my bike, went in, and I ran. And I ran around, and I ran around, and I ran around. And I thought, oh, okay, this is pretty good. Unfortunately, um, um, as I was running, doing another loop, I'm going by, a cop car went by. And he stopped, and he backed up. And I could feel it. <clears throat> and when he backed up, I stopped and I looked at him <laughs> and he says, hey, what you doing? Um, jogging? And he looked at me up and down, you know, sized me up and I got really uncomfortable. He sized me up and he says, okay, go ahead. But anyways, what happened was it, I continued to run, but the 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 spell was gone it broke it was mm. all of a sudden i was aware of oh, oh this is hard the mat the to me the magic was gone so i finished and went back to the y which is um not very far it's like across the street half mile maybe so i went back to the y and i walked into the lady the locker room and as i'm passing the desk i could see people go what the heck they were looking at but I've looked in the mirror and oh my goodness gracious my face was white red with black rings oh wow <laughs> no wonder people were looking at me and I looked horrible and I thought oh my gosh and I'm looking at my face and I went how can I look so bad when I feel so good I look so bad and I feel so good but in the meantime I'm peeling off my clothes and it's like they're soaked I mean they were soaked I have never been that soaked in my life. Huh. So in the meantime, okay, I'm the only one in the locker room. And, and it's in the after in the morning. There's not many women working out because this is almost the time of uh, aerobics. They were just starting to come in as I was starting to run because the people trying with wearing Reeboks were in the gym. And they asked me, to, hey, you should come do this aerobic thing. And I went, no, no, I'm not going to wear a leotard <laughs> and jump around. <laughs> I'm going to go out there. So in any case, so I'm the only one in the locker room. And I peeled off my clothes. And they had a scale. Get this. They had a scale. You know, the old fashioned. Do, 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 do. Yeah. So I stood on it. And it moved. It moved three spaces. And I thought, ha, huh, I lost three pounds cool and I thought ha huh, by the end of the week I'll be 20 pounds lighter <laughs> I so you know I didn't know that it was water you know water weight that didn't dawn on me and that was okay I was very excited 
I stepped in the shower, I turned on the shower and I let the water, I looked up and let the water, you know, hit my head, my forehead and just, it felt so good. It just felt so good that I didn't cry, but I wept. Mm. I wept. It just came not like a boo-hoo, but like from inside which I never really had before. And I thought, wow, wow. And I was so taken. I've never felt those feelings before. And I thought, wow, if nobody, if nobody can give me this, then nobody can take it away. Mm. That's what I thought. I was happy. (laughs) Mm -hmm. I mean, even though I cried, but I was happy and it was like, wow, I was so happy. But the next day I couldn't move. I, I, I was in bed and my ashtray and cigarettes are over there. And I went to reach over <laughs> and I couldn't move. I ached everywhere, everywhere did I ache. So by the time I got to my cigarettes, I was like, wow, wow, that hurt. And, but the feeling didn't leave me. The feeling didn't leave me. And I tried to run every day for about three weeks. And it was about three weeks time that went by before I could run again. And I did it again. (laughs) I hurt. So I ended up running like seven miles, seven loops, which is, it turned out to be a mile around and like in about an hour. Hmm. Whoa. Yeah. Yeah. I I mean, I couldn't do that now. (laughs) Maybe I could, but I probably feel the same way. I wouldn't be able to run <laughs> for another three weeks. In any case, the, that's why I continued running because of the feeling. Um, and I knew, and I tell people that I coach, and especially when I had my, my youth team, um, that nobody could give it to them. Their parents couldn't go to Toys R Us and buy it. Um, you can't go to aisle you know, eight and, and buy this. You have to earn it. And once you earn it, it's yours and nobody can take it away. And so that's what I learned. And that's what I share with others. And so a lot of it was trial and error. Um, And the group that I ran with, (laughs) me and my big mouth, there was this one guy named Jake, Jake Mahoney's a cop. He was a cop. He's retired now. And uh, he was a 238 marathon runner. And he was part of the group that I tried to hang on to. And I could only hang on for a mile. And then it was like a mile and a half. And then it was maybe two miles. And then I would finish with them. I couldn't hang on, but I finished close to them. Of course, it was like race pace for me. I, now they call it threshold. <laughs> mm-hmm. Or, you know, I would pick it up and drop back, pick it up and drop back. And they call that fartlek. <laughs> I had all this stuff, you know, I just did it on my own. In any case, um, I was running, they were relating stories about the Boston Marathon. They had just finished, it was really hot year, 76. And I was listening to, this is just the first mile. So um, I was listening and I blurted out, I'm gonna do that. And they said, do what? I'm gonna, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do that, that, that marathon. Oh, do you know what a marathon is? No. Um, well, you know, it's 26.2 miles. <laughs> I didn't laugh then. I was just quiet. I went, oh, and then I'm thinking, oh, you did it again. You bit off more than you could chew. And I was so mad, but I had said it. <clears throat> I said it. So once I say it, I owned it. And I thought, oh, oh, now I got to do this marathon. Then, then get this. <clears throat> then they tell me I had to qualify. So <clears throat> I don't have a year to prepare. Like I'm thinking oh, it's a whole year. Oh, it's like way, <clears throat> way over there. No problem. I have like five months. <laughs> That's crap. So he says, yeah, we're all going to uh, Newport, Rhode Island. You should run that one. Good course. It's the first year. Okay. So I ended up, um, 
I did run it. Um, but prior to that, I did one run 16 miles only because I knew the course, what they, what the guys ran and by listening how long it was. And I did a few 10 milers, but the beauty of it that I try to translate this to people that I coach, especially the newbies <laughs> and the older. Um, if you have it in here, it's mind over matter, but the matter matters. If you have it in here and you can back it up with physicalness, you know, strength, you can do it. So I didn't know, I had heard terrible stories about the marathon that just terrible things that it hurts and it's awful and you just want to die. <laughs> And I thought, okay, I'll do that. But prior to going to the Mar Newport, I won 16 miles. And my highest week at this was only 40 miles. <laughs> okay. So, you know, but in my mind, that's a lot. That's a lot. I mean, a marathon is 26 and my highest week was 40. I thought I was golden. <laughs> so um, the night before the race, the day before the race, I went down to my mother's house to say goodbye to everybody. Um, literally I was going to say goodbye because I thought I was going to die. Oh no. Yeah, really. <clears throat> Honest to goodness. I, I really, I was prepared to die. I thought I was going to die and I went down and nobody was home except my little sister. She must've been seven. So I walked in and nobody's home and she says, what do you want? I said, can I give you a hug? And we were in a demonstrative family. And so she stood up on a chair at the kitchen table and she said yeah so I went over and I hugged her and I said Maureen I'm gonna do a marathon and she goes oh what's that it's a race and it's 26 miles oh why are you gonna do that I don't know but I think I'm gonna die <laughs> It was so melodramatic, but that's the truth. I mean, I laughed back, but you know, the feeling behind it was very real. And <laughs> I had felt so miserable and unhappy in my life at that time that the alternative was this. And I welcomed it with open arms <laughs> because it felt so good. <laughs> but if I had to die to do it, so be it. <laughs> When you said way back when you were talking about how you were fearlessly doing the water skiing, right? Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 Looking at your story in your life, I'd be like, she's Patty is fearless. She's a <laughs> fearless person. But I, I, what I'm hearing from you is that you're saying that you, you do fear it, but then you like face it head on almost right away with some of these things. Oh yeah. Well, well, okay. You know, when you're, when you're really scared, not, not like scared, scared, like someone's going to kill you or something, but I mean like fear, like, <gasps> um, yeah, you, you, your pit sweat, well, your feet get clampy, you know, clammy and your, your hands. <sighs> and I could feel myself get hot, uh, get red and I could feel my mouth go dry. <sighs> I don't like those feelings, but I know that's my fear. Oh, that's how it happens to me. And then I just go, I, I would go, okay. <laughs> just like that. I would just, and it would, I would make either, either it's called make peace with it or welcome it, whatever. I just knew I had to try. And you have to understand too, I never tried at anything in my life really. <laughs> Oh yeah. I, okay. I start, I stood on top of the pyramid, which I'm very proud of. Um, um, but at the time I wasn't proud. It was just, I got the part because I was the littlest, <laughs> not because I was talented, because I was little. <laughs> and I thought, okay, but that was fine. And I did it. I mean, I had to stand on somebody's shoulders. I had to stand on somebody's shoulders, not just his shoulders, but one shoulder on one person and another leg, my right leg on the left shoulder of the other person. But you did it because you just did it. You, you don't have time. I didn't have time to, to think about it, to address it, to 
you just have to do it. People go, come on, let's go. Oh, okay. And then you just do it. And the same thing with the running. I just kind of, and all I knew going into Newport was that I, when it started to hurt, <laughs> I was all prepared. Um, when it started to hurt, I was going to run harder. And I think I did that, but I don't remember it hurting. And I don't remember much of the race. I do remember the start. I was married at the time. And at the start of the race, uh, oh, I married one of the guys in the group. <laughs> you don't do that, but I did. Um, I married one of the guys in the group. And at the start of the race, well, we didn't run. We didn't train together. We didn't run together. And he turned around and he looked at me. He was running with another guy from the group. And he looked at me and he said, hey, um, do you want me to stay with you like the first loop? No, go. No, no, I'll be fine. Just go, go, go. I'm fine. So he turned around again, you know, and he said, are you sure? I said, yeah, I'm sure. Go, I'm fine. So the gun goes off and off we go and they go and then I'm in my thing. And I didn't even know it was a loop course until the fifth year. <laughs> I, and he said loop, but it, it didn't like register. But I really didn't know it was a loop course until the fifth year. It was crazy. So uh, when I finished, I heard, I don't remember anything about the race. Nothing do I remember other than the start, that conversation, and the finish. And the finish, I hear, and the first woman, Patty of Quincy. And I didn't register and because I'm coming in. So around the bend and I'm coming in and I'm just running and I hear the first woman and I'm kind of looking around first woman and then I cross the line and it's a banner <laughs> and so what I'm in the I know I know I'm in the shoot I'm in the shoot and a few people runners up from me is my husband and the and the and a little ahead of him was his the other guy his friend there so he turned around and he looked at me and he said, did you drop out? No, I just finished. Didn't you hear? I'm the first woman. <laughs> and he said, no, really? He says, and I looked at him and I said, hey, hey, what did you run? He said, I did a 253. <gasps> really? I did a 253.40. If I knew you were that close, I would have beat you. <laughs> I did socialize after races with people that were really good, the, the men. And, you know, the good New England runners. And uh, I just listened to their chat, how they trained, what they did and how they felt. And, you know, and none of them smoked. And I, I smoked because I was still in another world. I wasn't in, in that world yet. I hadn't committed. And then once I started to commit to myself to be the best that I could be, and not to be a fast runner, I wanted to be the best that I could be and to give myself a chance. And it started with that. And it was, I asked somebody, I said, <clears throat> over time, I would say, hey, what can I do to get faster? And they say, well, do you do push-ups? No. Well, you should do push-ups. Okay. So I do push-ups. <laughs> and then I'd ask uh, later, hey, what else can I do to get faster? Uh, do you do sit-ups? No. Well, you should do sit-ups. Oh, okay. Time goes on. I want to know. So I'm doing these sit-ups and push-ups every day and I'm running, you know, every day. And if I can't run, I'm very disappointed. So I make sure I run every day. <laughs> and I ask somebody, hey, <clears throat> do you know what I can do to be faster? And they said, yeah, Patty, you should really quit smoking. <gasps> oh, and I didn't think anybody knew I smoked. <laughs> little do I not did I know because I didn't really smoke after that after I did that at Newport I really didn't smoke around others because uh, a friend of mine not a friend um, a mentor who ended up being my mentor later in life um, happened to go by and I was kind of embarrassed but I continued to smoke and I didn't find out for years later that they knew I smoked because I didn't think anybody did that was of note. It was Gloria Ratty. She was the VP of the, <laughs> of the BAA. <laughs> and it was after we got to know each other after all the running and thing, we'd go to lunch, you know? 
And she, she told me one time, she goes, yeah, I knew you smoked. I said, you did not. I did not. And she goes, yes, you did. Newport Marathon with so-and-so. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So it was really, I was called out. But in any case, the, um, I really wanted to try. I never really tried. I, I dropped out of college because I'd rather, you know, play kitty whist and drink beer. It just wasn't for me. And then I found the running. Thank you, Suzanne Haja. Wow, Susan Haja, thank you so much. I'm glad I bumped into her on that floor because I don't know what I would have done. Um, I tried bike riding in the beginning and two guys went by in a car, whacked me on the butt. <laughs> I went oh, flying no. over the handlebars. I tried to do swimming at the local Y and they opened at six o'clock for adult swim. You can swim the lane. So I went. And it was closed because the lifeguard didn't show up. Well, I said, you know, I'm just not going to do this. I am. I'm not going to rely on anybody. I'm going to just do me. So that's why the running, everything, it just, it, everything came in. Doo, 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 doo. Nice little thing. And I'm so glad I stuck with it. <laughs> um, and yes. So, and so are we. <laughs> oh, I'm glad. There had to have been like a turning point for you from where you were running because it was the highest caloric burner <laughs> to winning races and getting the American record and a world record. I'd love to hear how the passion was invigorated and how that, how that was part of your journey. I wanted to be the best that I could be. Um, a person, I was refused twice for coaching and only because at that time, uh, especially on the East coast, you know, they weren't women coaches, I mean, women runners. And I was older. I was like 23, 24, 25. Um, I was a woman. I was old to, to run and be in a sports team. And I had asked one person to coach me and they said, no. I asked another coach, another person to coach me and they said, no. So by the time I did get a coach, um, I, he asked me a question and the question was your goals. I was like, okay. And I was so overwhelmed. I know it's, it was like a, I hate it in school. Like, what do you want to be when you grow up? I don't know. <laughs> My daughter changed her major five times. <laughs> you never okay. really know. We're always growing up. Oh, no, you're 17, 18 years old. What the heck? <laughs> oh, yeah, I want to be, you know, what? But anyways, uh, he asked me a question and the question was, what is your goal? What do you want to do? And I was so overwhelmed with I just stood there and I could feel like heat. I could feel the sweat. You know, I was starting to get clammy. And I thought. It was such a broad stroke question. I just looked at him and I said, I want to be the best I can be. And he said, okay. And I, I, that's all I wanted to do <laughs> was to be the best I could be. And so I worked. And each time that I worked, you know, I got a little better and I would challenge myself. Well, I could do this for 10k can I do it for a 15k hmm can I do it for a half marathon oh, I wonder if I could do it for a marathon woo, woo, woo. <laughs> you know? so that, that's how it was and and I did so many races because I really loved being around the running scene the runners they were passionate and talkative and gusto and you know death <laughs> It's great, you know, and if you didn't do what you wanted to do, even though some people may, have, you know, you win your race or you win your division and you're not happy with what you did. And somebody's always there to say, hey, you ran today, though, right? You got your run in. I go, oh, yeah, I got my run in. Yay, your life is good. It just gave me life. I had a passion for it. it freed me up. Um, it just. A valve would let was released and I wanted to going back to when I first started running, I was swimming a little and riding my bike. 
I actually made a clock and I wrote out my time, go to work, what I did after work, what time I came home, what time I woke up. So my day was squat. And I wanted to have one hour for me. And I was going to do anything I wanted. And I did the bath thing. Cosmopolitan magazine said, you know, sit in the tub. Eh, didn't work. So I started, I went back to the time that I was the happiest. And when I was the happiest was when I was a kid. When I was a kid, it's with a, I was active. I could, I, I had to babysit a lot. I had eight brothers and sisters. There's nine of us. And there's five years between me and the, my sister. And so I had a lot of responsibility at a young age and my time was limited. So if I had any time to go out, I just hopped on my bike <laughs> and go. And that was the happiest time. And it came out in my running that that was my happiest time. I could just go. I didn't care what happened the rest of the day because I got my run in. I got, I took care of Patty because Patty's happy. You can do anything to her now. <laughs> it didn't matter. You know, you live life as you, it's a 24 hour, seven day a week thing, not just an hour a day. Um, it's more. And then I could, it was like, yeah, hmm, I could do that. <laughs> so, and so after a while, I just sought out the competition. <laughs> I just went after it. And I, because it was, a, it was fun. It was fun for me. I loved it. Are you fit? I'm coming for you today. I'm, I'm going to try my hardest. <laughs> and I would. And sometimes it worked. Sometimes it didn't. Sometimes I got sucking. <laughs> but, you know, the girls, the women, the, the girls weren't as, as, as happy <laughs> to hear my words. The guys, however, loved it. Because they go, oh, yeah? I go, yeah. <laughs> I loved it. And I loved the idea of pushing and seeing what you can do when it's on the line. Mm -hmm. You know? Who cares what you yeah. do in practice? Practice is just practice. It's practice mm -hmm. to do what you want to do when the time comes. Now, the biggest thing to be an Olympian, those guys, I mean, to be in a race like that, they have to be ready a certain day a certain time. <laughs> wow. So I kind of put that on myself too, to be ready, certain day, certain time mm -hmm. with people mm -hmm. there and just to be on no matter what, to be able to pull it out. So I call it pulling it out of your hat. You know, sometimes you just gotta, it's there. You don't feel like doing it. You wake up feeling not good, but you're committed. I did this race, Cascade Runoff, and I had a hard time with it. I couldn't run on the um, Olympic trial exhibition, the 10K on the track with Joni and Julie and Mary and all those guys. And I had asked if I could, and I, they said, no, you can't. And I was not happy. So I begged, then I begged, and I hate begging. You know, that's like so bad. You don't want to beg. You have to accept no as no. But I begged and it was still no. So I didn't know what I could do to draw attention to, I, I told the person, I told these people, you let me run and you want, they wanted me to be a road runner. So I couldn't run the track. And they wanted me to run this race, the 15K, the next, you know, I was like, okay, I, I, I begged. I said, oh, let me run. I'll win both. I'll, I'll win this. I will win this, the track race. I will win it and I'll win that. And they go, no, no, Patty, no, no. <sighs> so I wanted, I think they thought I was talking through my hat. And I thought I was mad and I was hurt. I cried. I cried, I was so mad. So I'm on the bus to go up there and Ronnie Wayne sits next to me. This is going to be in the movie, I think. Um, Ronnie Wayne, the national marathon champ, sits next to me because nobody sits next to me. Nobody on this bus. The, everybody passed me because <laughs> I'm seething. I'm mad. And 
So he sits and he goes, can I sit here? And I, I probably shot him a bad look. Yeah. I turn. So the bus takes off and he says to me, eventually he says, um, you don't seem happy. I look at him, I go, nah. So like, what's the matter? Nothing. And he asked me again. I said, well, you really want to know? I said, that, blah, 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 I tell him. And I said, now I'm trying to figure out what I can do to make them believe that I could do both. I, would, I told them I would have won the 10K and I told them I would have won the Cascade runoff. I told them I would do it and I have to prove it, but I don't know what to do. <laughs> so this is where he says to me, he says, you know, if you believe it, it will happen. I said, believe what? He said, what's your time? My best time? Ah, 52, 40 something. And he said, oh, I said, so I'm trying to think of what I can do to prove that I could do it. So then I pick something out. I pick out, I'm gonna break 50 minutes. <laughs> so he says, you sure? I said, yep. Yeah. And he said, well, you know, if you see it and you believe it, it will happen. And I say, really? And he said, yeah, okay. So I sit there the rest of the trip and I'm going over the whole thing in my head. I don't know the course or anything, but I'm going over the distance in my head. I'm going over the repeat miles. I'm going over 80 second quarters. I'm going over everything in my mind, what it feels like, what I, what I can do. And then it happened. Then it, I know that it's going to happen. I, I believe it's going to happen. Therefore it's going to happen. So <laughs> About two o'clock in the morning, the rest of the uh, Olympic trial people come into the hotel and my coach knocks on the door, comes in and I'm jumping on the bed. And he said, you're not sleeping. I said, no. I said, do you know what I'm going to do as I'm jumping on the bed? I said, I'm going to break 50 minutes. And he goes, oh, no, Patty, don't do this. Don't do this. I said, well, I'm going to break 50 minutes. And he said, no, don't, don't, don't just try to win. Just win it, just win it. That would be great, just win it. I said, nope, I'm breaking 50 minutes. And not even thinking, I don't care about winning or not. I'm gonna do this. <laughs> so I don't know if I sleep or not, but at 5.30 in the morning, I'm outside I'm doing a warm up. You know, I'm, I'm running. I come back in, take a shower, I have something a little bit to eat. I go back out, do another warm up. I do strides and each stride I'm like, I'm gathering. I can just feel things coming in. And so the coach says to me, um, Patty, don't take the lead. Don't take the lead. Don't take the lead. Don't take the lead till after five. And I'm like, after five? What are you kidding me? He says, let them lead. So, okay. So it goes off and I'm right here. I'm in between two girls, two runners. I'm right here. And I'm not having it. I'm thinking they're going too slow. They're going too slow. They're going too slow. And I could feel the, the heat like come up. And I say, and I think, get out of here. You can do this. Because my, some of my fear uh, at the time, if whenever you take the lead, if I pass somebody in the late stages, I always feared that they're gonna come up on me. I pass them. I go on the outside. I take the lead like around, I don't know, a mile and a half, two. So I have to fight all of this. I have like eight miles. <laughs> I don't care. I go. I come down to the finish. I, I don't see anything. I don't remember anything in the race. Um, I come down to the finish and there's three coaches together. My coach, Bob Sevigny, and... Um, Bill, Bill Squires and they're on the medium and I see them and I take my fist and I jump up in the air and I look right at them and I say I told you I'd do it <laughs> I did 49 42 <gasps> 49 42 wow so I mean at that time it was like a new American record and it was mm -hmm. it was exciting but that wasn't the exciting part for me the exciting part for me was that I could do 
what I thought I could do. And it had to go against other people's thinking, like, don't do this. Don't you blow up? You know, why do you want to do that? That is, that's impossible for you. You're only a 52 minute. <laughs> oh, well, <sighs> prove that wrong. <laughs> so, you know, it has a lot to do with the mind mm -hmm. and the emotion. And I was very physically strong, very physically mm -hmm. strong. So I could back it up and it was just a, a release here. And I was bound and determined, <laughs> bound mm -hmm. and determined <laughs> to do it. For us all, for our listeners, it's so incredibly valuable, valuable and generous of you to share your story, what your processes are, what your journey is like. And for all of us who just see Patty world record, <laughs> American record breaker, she must never fear or have <laughs> concerns or feel uncomfortable. But when you tell us about your journey, we can relate to you because we feel these things too, as runners, you know, that we can see your story and hear about you. And then it can invigorate us because we, we feel these same types of challenges as you have called them, these challenges that, uh, running brings to us. And so we thank you, Patty, oh, for coming to the show here today. Thank you for listening. It's really hard to pick one thing to reflect on from that interview because there were so many things that resonated with me. I wrote a few down and I'll share some on Instagram too. But one thing that she said that really stuck with me was mind over matter, but the matter matters. Wait, what? What? So if you believe it. <laughs> matter, matter, matter. And you can back it up with like strength and the physical aspect, then you can do it. So, of course, you have to have the training. Of course, you have to have all that lining up. But then you got to have the mental aspect mm. honed in as well. She spoke about her breakthrough when she got that 15K American record, which was phenomenal. But that was a point where she turned that physical training into something that was, you know, never done before. You know, mm. no one had ever run that fast uh, in the U.S. So... I thought that was really an encouraging thing to hear. And then she also spoke about what we've talked about quite often here on the A to Z running podcast, which is uh, the obligatory runner. Like it doesn't work mm. if you're just obligated and you're not having fun. And if it's not feeding positive things into your life, instead, we should find joy in it. And this is a quote that she said, there's a lot of energy in happiness. It's a wellspring of energy. And this is what she says about her athletes. If I can get you there, you're there. Bets are off. You can do anything. Mm. So not only was the conversational su super inspiring, but also we had a lot of great conversation about training that we didn't get a chance to share here in the podcast because we had we had a great hour and a half long conversation <laughs> and I have more nuggets of wisdom to share with you from Patty. So stay tuned for that. But wait, there's more. But wait, there's more. But for now... We'll kind of stop it there and simply say thank you so thank much you, Patty. Patty for sharing those insights, those experiences. I, I love the combination of here's my experience and here's what I've learned from it and can mm. share with others. It's great. Powerful stuff. Now, speaking of great experiences to share, let's get on to the world of running. All right, before we get into the public side of the world of running, let's just simply acknowledge some massive congratulations to A to Z runners Madeline and Mike, who debuted in the marathon this past weekend, their Congrats. first ever. And many of us know that moment, recall that experience, and can all simply congratulate them together. Mm -hmm. Impressive stuff for sure. Now, I hope that the two of you are recovering well and <laughs> feeling better soon, <laughs> right? Yes. All right, now... Let's start with the Milrose Games. We mentioned in preview last week that there were some exciting things coming. The exciting things came. But before we tell you about those, we just wanted to share a brief background on the event itself because it's, first of all, incredible because this is the 114th Milrose Games. It blew my mind, guys. Because I was like, how? Did, I didn't even realize that indoor track was going on that long in the U.S. Now, of course, I don't know exactly what it looked like in 1908 sure. when things began. 
Um, but they have certainly a longest track record of uh, meetings of this sort. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know in the world, maybe, but certainly in the United States. And that being the case, we did also want to mention that they have moved locations. Obviously, over the years, you're not necessarily going to the same location for 114 years. Well, I guess it's possible. But having once been at the Madison Square Gardens, um, they now compete at the Armory, which is world renowned is mm-hmm. an indoor track facility, um, certainly considered by them and many who have competed there to be the fastest indoor track meet in the world. Um, so that's significant. It's been at the Armory since 2012, by the way. Now, one other note, the headline event is called the Wanamaker Mile. Now, why? Of course. Oh, why is it called the Wanamaker Mile is always an interesting thing. So the Milrose Athletics Association, which started the event in 1908, um, was basically began, begun by uh, the group that began it um, were employees of John Wanamaker Department Store and oh. named the event in honor of, well, Rodman Wanamaker, the owner of the John Wanamaker Department Store. Um, however, it was not originally a mile. It was originally 1.5 miles. That is fascinating. Yeah, because okay. remember, in 1908, they didn't care so much about things like standardization of distances. Sure. They just did whatever. They so, just wanted to run against each other. Why not? Yeah. All right. Excellent stuff there. There's your little background in history. So now you know this event is significant, if you didn't already know that. Now let's talk about what happened. Yeah. As we set up for you last week, there were amazing performances, and the results are amazing. So just want to put that out there. Okay. For the men, Bryce Apple. Is this an amazing event, too? It's amazing. But are the other ones also amazing? All of the events... Hmm that took place at Milrose were quite amazing. Everyone get out your counters <laughs> how many and count how many times someone says amazing for the next I'll try not to make minutes. it my crutch word. Okay. 800 for the men. There were upsets and legends. For the men, we have Bryce Hoppel winning over a strong field, including African indoor record holder and 2019 Milrose champ, Michael Saruni of Kenya. Ah, who, uh, yes, had... What, what was his, um, he was in the Olympics, let's see, semifinalist, I believe, okay. if I can recall, um, which actually means then, let's count them here. So Bryce Hopple, Olympian, Michael Cerrone, Olympian, uh, also in the race, Isaiah Jewett, Olympian, Jesus Tanatiu Lopez of Mexico, Olympian, Charlie Hunter, Olympian, and Isaiah Harris, Olympian. So those were all Olympic 800 meter runners that was in stacked. this one race. Now yeah. you can see why we talk about this as like a world premiere event when mm-hmm. things like that happen. You know it's true. So Bryce Hopple, nice win. Nice win. And for the women, ah. one of our household favorites, if we're allowed to have those, Ajay Wilson, she won her ninth consecutive Milrose Games 800. Whoa. Also marking her 16th consecutive win on the track for the Armory. That's incredible. I know. So basically so you have to assume other events, if you're other running years. at the Armory, you're probably not going to win the women's 800. Because that's Ajay Wilson's it's, job. It's, it's her job, apparently, for over a decade. That's an absolutely incredible. And I watched the event. It was on NBC. And she looked, as always, so in control and smooth. I hmm. that If you have a chance to watch Ajay Wilson or look back, I'm sure that there's plenty of her, of her races on YouTube. Watching her race is it, it's like peaceful. Which is weird because I know, like, in huh. race, there's like a lot of adrenaline, but she, like watching her run is like a very, very rhythmic and controlled experience. Okay. So <laughs> that's cool. Um, also, why when we interviewed her for the podcast, we were asking her specifically about how to hold composure. Yeah, under that was pressure. the conversation. That was the question yep. and the conversation. Um, so, very fast 800 meter runners, they're performing. Very well. Now, in the Wanamaker Mile, the headliner event, um, we, it just got even better. So, for the men's mile, I'll talk about the men's. You can talk about the women's. How about that, Andy? I watched it I on know, TV, though. I know, but I, I, I'll give the I'll details give and you give afterwards. the impressions because, <laughs> yes. Okay, so tons of amazing stories from this one race. Um, so, first of all, Ali Hoare won the race of Australia, of On Athletics Club, um, in a decisive final hundred meters like the kind of final hundred meters that makes you wish that you could do that just to make everybody 
look so bad. It was you. brilliantly or, run. It was brilliant, something. brilliantly run. Indeed, and you know that's not a surprise with Ali Hor, who is a master at racing. Um, so here's what he did: he won the race, but he didn't just win it. He won it over Tokyo bronze medalist Josh Kerr of Great Britain, uh -huh. which is great. And he won it in a new Australian and Oceania indoor mile record, running 350.8. Mm -hmm. 350. I do want to mention, because I wanted to put my two cents in here. So, Ali, there was a you know group up front. There was a pacer and everything. And uh, Josh Kerr actually passed Ali um, with a couple laps to go. But then Ali took it back and then ended up having the final kick there in the end. But, like, Ali let him. Like, he didn't, again, composure. He didn't lose his composure when Josh Kerr passed him. But I think Josh Kerr also knew, like, I'll, you know, Ali is a threat. Like, I need to start going now. I don't want to leave it to the last kick. So, anyway, it was well done by both of them. Ali showed his strength and his, and his smarts there in, in this event. Let's all just reflect a moment, too, on the fact that these men running this incredibly fast are still, like, making decisions during the race. They're not just basically right. thinking, run as hard as I can until I get to the line. Yeah. No, they're not because, you know, they're that amazing. Yeah, all remember right. Josh Kerr, didn't he? He has the fastest mile ever run on U.S. soil, even though he's from Great Britain. I, that happened I do not know this past that year. Yeah, I think but so. that's awesome. Also, so Col Colby Alexander finished third and in a 352 personal best time. But especially why that's so significant for him is because this was a PR after six years of not running personal best times. So his previous PR was from 2016. Um, and any time an athlete can overcome a dearth like that. It's, it's so encouraging because a lot of us have those yeah. spells of, yeah, dry spells. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That was great. So good job, Colby Alexander. Now, back in the race a little ways was an another incredible story, and in my opinion, probably one of the most incredible stories of the day, um, which revolved around ninth place finisher Nick Willis yes. of New Zealand. Now, Willis is, uh, how old is Nick, Andy? He's like 38. I'm not going to Okay, so he's 30-something. <laughs> and um, and many, no, he is 38. Okay, I, I've, got the, I've got the numbers right in my head. So Nick Willis is 38 years old. He ran his first sub four mile at the age of 18 and has been running professionally ever since for 20 years. Now, 20 years. You could say like th there's a kind of a scaling, sliding thing here because um, – he also like works full time for Tracksmith and such. And, you know, so he's just like he lives in the running world in many capacities. Um, Nick Willis just ran 359.7 for what now marks the 20th consecutive year of running sub four in the mile. 20 years 20 straight. Years. It's impressive folks. to get on that sub four list once. That's impressive to get on it one time. But 20 years yeah two decades yeah nick That's... willis you are legendary here it is for you here's a quote from nick willis this was reported by new york times he said it's such a fun social outlet for me <laughs> fun social outlet running you know sub four miles for 20 years straight willis said and i enjoy keeping the young kids honest whenever i can yes that's well, great because he training partner hobbs training kessler part, yeah. who's 18 years old you yeah. know up and coming phenom stud and it, and was also pacing Willis for this vast accomplishment. Just incredible stuff. Yeah, they got to work together. How about the women, cool. Andy? For the women, unsurprisingly, El Prier St. Pierre took home the victory in a new world lead of 419.30. She was a full second over the second place of the U.S., Josette Norris. Norris of the yeah and that she claimed second place in a personal best time of 420.30 and then Germany star Coco mm. Constance Klosterhofen Constance Klosterhofen is it was that right Something are like you correcting me no I'm just um, saying it <laughs> and she was in third in 422.59 notice a little bit of a gap there oh, yeah. Um, a little over two seconds there. And then fourth place finisher was Jessica Hull she broke the Australian national record in a time of four 24.06 so Australian, Two Australian records. records down in one day down yeah. yes mm, that's good stuff well it didn't get any worse after that <laughs> well actually we're doing these in the opposite order of how they happened in the event but anyway in the 3,000 meters on athletics club 
an on athletics club. I know. Just kept just it up. I know. So uh, to make the day just amazing for the men, um, Gordy Beamish of New Zealand stole is the best word here. Stole the victory from once Oregon teammates Cooper Tier. And Nobody Cole owns the win until there's. Uh, yes, the you're exactly line, right. So. so he didn't steal it, but uh, something of that nature. So here's basically how this unfolded. Cooper Tier and Cole Hawker were run charging down the straight side by side. It was the classic battle. These guys were teammates and and Oregon, and now are you know we're both running professionally for Nike. It's just cool stuff. Well, they were kind of drifting out a little bit. And as Beamish said in a post-race interview, he said, I just knew, like, I could see that the battle was there between the two of them. They were totally focused on that. Remember, So they were slowly easing out because that tends to be what happens. Yeah. And he bided his time on the rail and in the final, boom, took the win right from Cooper Tier's shoulder. And it's just awesome. So running 739.5 over Cooper Tier's 739.6. Got the one so tenth close. win. Yeah. Cole Hawker, by the way, only a couple more tenths behind in 739.8. That marks for Gordy Beamish a new Zealand indoor 3,000 meter national record, which and is amazing. And world lead time. And world lead. Absolutely that. Um, well, ish. No, it is. It, for indoor. Um, because they're faster out. There's been faster three thousand meters. I think it's outdoors. for the indoor yes, circuit, yes, though. They true. count them separately. That's right. Yeah, always confusing to me. Okay, in fourth place, by the way, Louis Grijalva, Grijalva of Guatemala, who is a new pro runner as well, having recently graduated from college. Um, set, set another national record for Guatemala this time in uh, fourth place. He was seven forty one point two. Wow, just so fast. So not not that far behind as it is, but. Get this, the first 10 men across the line all set personal best times in the 3,000 meter. <laughs> and you could That's say- what happens in a fast race. It, it is. You could say things like, oh, if, if this is an event, people just don't really run that much and stuff. No, these are people who run this yeah. event a lot, or at least do it often enough. That includes the likes of Connor Mance. If you recall, he was the recent NCAA cross-country mm-hmm. champion for his second time and then turned pro right after that, as well as Drew Hunter- We've talked about him in the past. He had some turmoil recently with like a coaching team situation and such, but it clearly appears to be finding his yeah. feet well. Absolutely. And the women, there were a lot of PRs going on there too. Another stacked field for them. Uh, U.S. 10K Olympian and previous guest Alicia Munson of the OAC. There it is. She took away the victory and a new world leading time and personal best of th- um, 831.62. Wow. Second was young, young. I'm sorry, <laughs> youngster, 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 Wayne Kaladi of the USA in a personal best time of eight thirty three point seven two, and then another national record occurred for Mexico's Lauren Gavlin, and she ran a time of eight forty two point two nine. Impressive stuff. Fast times. Yeah. Everywhere. So I, we wanted down. to mention because there's been some talk of this, but. Dathan Ritzenhine, who's been on the show a couple times, he was, of course, a three-time Olympian and so. An what's more important holder. that he's been on the show a couple of times? No, I'm, he's a I'm, just, I'm just well because <laughs> if people listen to this podcast, yes, they'll have heard from him. He coaches three of those winners that we just mentioned. Well, he only coaches winners. <laughs> if you don't win races, then you're off the team. That's not true. As a matter of fact, Actually, the moment you don't win a race, you are off. The have team. thrived under him and yeah. and gotten their first um, big like major. Um, U.S. or global wins. Yeah. Yeah. So, really impressive stuff coming out of OAC. to the OAC. There's a really, a really interesting tidbit floating around out there. It's not part of our planned schedule here, but Helen Obiri of Kenya, who, you know, like multiple world and Olympic medalist and all this kind of stuff. Amazing. Um, she just signed with On and moved, or moving at least, to Boulder, Colorado, mm-hmm. clearly associated with Dathan's group, which is based out of Boulder, the on running club um, on athletics, but the, the ons ons feature club. Um, interesting. 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 She's, Wondering she's going why. to like keep her other coach, but yeah. obviously with the influence of this group, there's clearly uh, an intentional connection there yeah. to some degree. So that's cool. All right. Now, number two, the real number two, um, just very briefly wanted to share with you because it's, Amazing. Wait, we already used that word a bunch. Incredible. Okay, number frigid. Uh, the, the number <laughs> one coldest marathon ever. Ever. Now, this is reported by The Hill, by the way, and a shout out to Kevin for sharing with us. Um, before I tell you how cold it was, a couple notes. This was in Siberia on January 21st. 
Why would anyone run a marathon in Siberia on January 21st? Well, because if you live in Siberia and it's January, why not? Um, I guess. It's called the Pole of Cold Marathon, which is fitting, uh, and specifically in Yakusha, Siberia. Okay. So there, there's your not background familiar, here. but okay. Now, how cold does it have to how be? How cold is cold, To Zach? get the record. Well, first of all, 65 different people ran in this thing. 65 okay, so different 50, people subjected 65, themselves they all to, live I have no idea. Through the that's ordeal. actually quite that's, morbid, Andy. Um, I'm just... I don't know. It wasn't reported, but... I didn't know it was possible to run in this How place. cold was it? Back to the original question. It was negative 63 negative degrees 63? Fahrenheit. What? Which, for those of you who are non-Fahrenheit people, that's negative 53 Celsius. Remember that there's a point somewhere around negative 40 where Fahrenheit and Celsius flip. And Fahrenheit becomes a bigger number. And so, anyway, so um, that's crazy. That's astounding. That's I don't need. I didn't even know that you could do that. Like I didn't know you could run well in negative sixty three degrees. Maybe you can't, and maybe you shouldn't, because if you're not terribly familiar with how cold that is, it's something like if you took a cup of water and threw it out a window at negative forty degrees, it would freeze pretty much instantly before it hits the ground. Solid ice when it hits the ground. So you were, and like, this is 23 degrees stuff? colder than that. Uh, I don't know what you wear, but you certainly cover everything. <laughs> right, because you'd you'd like get frostbite. I speculated with Kevin when he shared this with us that you probably, in order to survive this, are wearing things like seal skins and polar bear hides. You think so? Yes, I think because those are the basically the only natural animals who should ever be in cold temperatures this cold. Okay, now that being the case, a quick note here that the winner for the men was Vasily Lukin of Russia. Of course, like who, who would travel anywhere else to run this? But Vasily Lukin ran a time of three hours and 22 minutes. So he was actually like moving. 322 <laughs> in negative 63 degrees Fahrenheit. And the winner of the women's race, Marina. Oh, boy. Let me try this. Sedalisheva. 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 Mm -hmm. uh, she crossed the line in four hours and nine minutes. I'm impressed. First of all. How are you outside for four hours in negative 63 degrees? I don't know. Okay. Well, aside from lighting your clothing on fire, they found a way and managed it in impressive performances. Yes. So that's nice. that. And all of those things and so much more are going on in the world of running, but we got to wrap it up for the moment. Yes. And let me say, because the question has certainly arisen, talking with a lot of runners right now, and we're all thinking about racing, like April, May, and we've got the race on the schedule. And, and we're dreaming of We're of, dreaming of better temperatures fast. if we're living in yeah. places Something like this. Something to get us through this. the winter. Yes, and uh, just wanting so badly to, you know, see those things come nearer. <laughs> but a quick note here, because if you're just not quite sure, yet what you need or how you need to achieve your goals we certainly as you know are glad to help and you can find that on a to look for the word coaching but i did want to mention very briefly we offer three services as we support athletes certainly we have the coaching program the coaching plan and that's the full package you know that's all the stuff it's the running schedules daily and weekly it's the strength and mobility recommendations race planning and as needed support communication all that kind of stuff will walk beside you but that's not necessarily the thing that everybody needs. And so we also offer just the plan. You can look for and want a single schedule for one season. Yep. Personalized plan. We'll talk to you and formulate what we believe you need to do to achieve your goals and then deliver that plan to you. However, some don't really know exactly what they need, but they've got questions or need some feedback and just would like to talk to somebody, and we can do that too. We have a consultation option. It's just a single conversation, so you don't have to commit to anything more than that, if that's helpful to you. So those are the kinds of services when we talk about our running support and what's available to athletes. But as always, remember that we would still love for you to just share any questions on your mind. Go to the social media places or just find us on adazyrunning.com and share a question on our contact forms because when you do that, we will feature your questions and our thoughts and response on our monthly Q&A episode at the end of the month. Mm -hmm. And that's that. That's that. We're so glad that you've joined us. I hope you all are staying warm and well as much as physically possible in this frigid winter. <laughs> At least you're not in Siberia running a marathon in exactly. negative 63. Exactly. Thanks so much for joining us, and we'll talk to you next week.